Welcome to this new episode of The Context. My name is David Orban, and today I want to talk to you about digital governance and digital regulations. My strong claim is that in the 21st century, all regulations and all governance should either be or aim to be digital as soon as possible. What does that mean? What are the implications? What is the context of regulations and governance being digital? We went through digital transformations many times. It has started when? Uh, with computers in the 50s, 60s, or with the personal computer revolution in the 80s, or with the internet um, in the 90s? Well, it could be claimed that it is only now with blockchain-based smart contracts, Internet of Things sensor networks, and AI tools that are able to make sense of the data that all of this can come together in order to deliver value to us who must benefit from this transformation. Well, it is not going to end, so maybe there will be other kinds of digital transformation 10 years from now or 20 years from now, but really we can start seeing how to create new types of organizations that natively take advantage of these tools that we have available. We can start seeing it and start testing it. Testing it means that we don't exactly know how they should be and we will make mistakes. Actually, we already made mistakes. We made a lot of mistakes. The biggest and the earliest was called the DAO. DAO, which stands for Decentralized Autonomous Organization. And the DAO was a very ambitious project that uh, aimed to be able to analyze economic resource allocation algorithmically so that people from all over the world would be able to decide and vote on what kind of projects, for example, should receive certain resources so that they could flourish and prove their own ideas. The code, the programs that ran the DAO were defective. These programs allowed a hack that um, did not leave the funds at the disposal of all the community uh, for voting on how to allocate them, but the hack was able to move a third of the total of $150 million, so about $50 million worth at the um, prices of the Ethereum Ether token at the time, well, they moved it and, and kept it separate, unavailable to the rest of the project. There was a lot of uh, debate at the time, and the project decided, um, together with the Ethereum community, it was a big deal uh, to do the unthinkable, to rewound the uh, blockchain uh, as if the DAO didn't happen basically sacrifice the immutability of the blockchain through a hard fork um, to the point where there were people who said, no, this should not be done. Uh, and they created keeping the purity of the original branch Ethereum Classic. Now, the reason why these details matter is for one, there will be mistakes made as we go along, creating 
digital regulations and digital governance. Two, there is a very strong role for meta rules, meta regulations, meta governance. Meaning, how do we design, implement, measure, and update the rules and the governance components that we have created if we want to evolve them? And of course, these meta regulations and meta governance components should aim to become digital as well, natively digital in the 21st century. So the DAO was uh, uh, an early experiment and currently there are many others. If you wish, Ethereum itself is an experiment in digital governance in the sense that uh, its smart contracts allow value to be algorithmically uh, associated with certain outcomes based on certain conditions. It has many participants and it is not just a, a single um, cohesive uh, set of objectives. Of course, it's a, an open platform for, for anybody to participate. But this view that the so-called killer app of the Ethereum blockchain is governance uh, is shared by many. For example, uh, by Andreas Antonopoulos, who is a very uh, respected um, thinker, author, and, and speaker about many things uh, blockchain, especially about Bitcoin, but he is not a Bitcoin maximalist in the sense that he believes that nothing else should exist apart from Bitcoin and Bitcoin is good and should be good for everything. He um, understands and he maintains that there is place for other experiments and for other things to prove their worth. If Bitcoin's killer app is money, he says Ethereum's killer app is governance. Now, when we talk about regulations and governance, uh, we can talk about private projects that are centralized or decentralized. But of course, we must also talk about the interfaces with the older world of human governance and human regulations, the society, the states, the nations that assumed to themselves the right and the duty to design, implement, and enforce a lot of regulations and a lot of components of, of governance. These concern the economic life of individuals and corporations, but they also concern, of course, how we live together, um, our security, uh, our ability to procure food and shelter uh, and uh, to um, produce and transport and consume energy uh, and uh, to, to learn and to teach and many other things. We are happy to complain about how badly governments work and how badly organized our democracies are, how bad overall the concept of democracy is, in the sense that it is very ineffective. Most often, uh, it either disregards the needs of a minority because the majority decided and the minority just should uh, shut up and go with the decisions of the majority, or as it happens in many circumstances, since a lot of people decide not to participate in the democratic process by not voting, what appears to be a majority decision is eventually a majority of the voters. But it can be a minority of the population. And then, if the majority of the voters has appointed 
an even smaller number of uh, people who are then selecting the president or the prime minister or other leading figures, well, it turns out that the decisions are made in a manner that is extremely, extremely, extremely centralized. Winston Churchill is uh, famous for having quipped, uh, democracy is the worst form of government, except every other form of government. And we pretended that he was joking for so long, believing that uh, we could afford to ignore what actually I believe was a challenge. It was a challenge to us to design something better, to come up with better solutions. So there is not only a huge economic incentive to design digital regulations and digital governance tools, whether based on blockchain, whether based on Ethereum or on anything else. But there is this incredible upside that if they work, they can be applied to how we govern our societies overall, not only corporations. How can we uh, vote? How can we implement the decisions, measure their effects, update them as needed uh, in a manner that is efficient, effective, inclusive, and representative of um, the needs and the objectives of everybody. So the stakes are pretty high. The fact that digital is the future of this uh, uh, component of our societies, uh, I, I think it's, it's evident. Let me give you a simple example of how digital is superior to, to, to non-digital, to analog older solutions. Have you ever tried to uh, trade stocks on the Nasdaq stock market, for example? You realize that uh, what you are doing is giving instructions to a computer. And even though um, the largest volume of trading is done by algorithmic hedge funds, there are still human traders that uh, decide to buy and sell stocks and hold them for a short or a long uh, period of time. But whether you are a computer trading algorithmically or you are a human trader pushing buttons because you want to buy or sell a given stock, Nasdaq every day goes to sleep and if you want to trade on the weekend, well, you can't either because Nasdaq and Nasdaq's computers are taking a few days off. And this is so quaint. This is so laughable. This is so not up to date to what are the needs and the opportunities of our current society that it is really endearing, except that it is also cringe-inducingly bad. And of course, we already have solutions. Crypto never sleeps. Blockchain-based exchanges uh, of uh, digital tokens work 24-7, 365 days a year. And that is where the stock market must go. It doesn't matter if we call the units that are being traded security tokens or if we call them digital assets or digital shares. As long as it is up to speed with the expectations of features and performance, inclusivity, lack of obstacles, openness, and borderless uh, operations. And of course, we have a lot of open governance 
and open government initiatives where lots of data are made available on how uh, governments work, what are their decisions, who voted, and, and, and what and why. Those are also very, very important tools for improving our decision making. And they should be universal. And the information that uh, they contain should be universally accessible in order to be uh, massaged, uh, in order for applications to be built on top. The reason why, on top of digital regulations and digital uh, governance tools, the Internet of Things, the sensor networks are so important, is because they represent the feedback loop. Regulations and, and governance or government decisions can tell us what should happen and with what resources, and then hopefully those things happen, but most of the time they don't exactly happen the way that uh, we thought. And then we must measure and communicate back to the source what the difference was, so that there can be certain adjustments to the decisions, updates to the regulations. And in a natively digital end-to-end -end solution, of course, those measurements, those communications, those feedbacks must be digital as well. That is the role of the Internet of Things and the sensor networks that allow this collection and handling of information. The third component uh, of uh, AI tools uh, are needed, of course, because we, humans, unaided, cannot make sense of what is going on in our complex world. And we need the help and the support in order to understand what is going on of ever smarter systems that can analyze and recognize patterns and then based on the way that they have been built or even evolved, as is, it happens uh, ever more often, they can tell us what is going on in order to better inform uh, the picture, better um, and more richly illustrate our understanding, our interpretation of the world. Now, Governments and, and regulators, of course, are in a strange position because we elect or appoint them pretending that they know uh, what is going on and that the regulations that they make are fit for purpose. But when we are innovating at the edges, by definition, this uh, cannot happen. So we have to be establishing a stronger and more open dialogue with the regulators. First of all, telling them that we understand that they will make mistakes as well and requiring them to admit that they know that they are fallible, that they know that they need to experiment. And this is the role of what are called regulatory sandboxes. Basically establishing a Regulatory sandbox is a mutual admission of not knowing yet what are the best regulations for the thing that we need to understand still. Mutual by the people who want to experiment and the regulators on the other hand. So these sandboxes are extremely important. That is where the innovation can happen protected from the assault of those who are not enabled or not honest enough to confirm that the older regulations of the wider world do not apply at the edges where we want innovation to find out how to find 
sustainable solutions for the world. These digital regulations and digital governance tools are going to take a long time to develop. We have to be patient, but we have to be also passionate about building them and experimenting them because they are dearly needed. So I hope that you enjoyed uh, this video. Uh, I am recording it in a, a new setting for you because I believe this is the first episode of the context uh, that I am recording here. Uh, actually, this is uh, uh, my study uh, at home uh, in uh, northern Italy, and uh, uh, I will be recording uh, the next few episodes here because as of right now, it doesn't look I will be traveling uh, too much for the first for the next uh, uh, few weeks. And uh, you will become a little bit uh, accustomed uh, to this background if you keep following uh, these videos. And you can keep following these videos if you uh, become uh, a member on Patreon, uh, a supporter of the context. For as little as uh, $5 a month, you will help me and my team uh, put these videos together as we explore together with you how the future is going to play out. Thank you.